everyone, I'm Amy Carruthers, the Director of Alumni Engagement at the University of Nevada. I'm here today in the John and Geraldine Lilly Museum in our University Arts Building on campus. Joining me today is Nevada alumna and Museum Director Vivian Zavataro. Vivian is a museologist and specialist in contemporary art, transhistoricity, and art mediation. She's traveled the world working in museums and galleries and contemporary art exhibitions in order to broaden her knowledge and expertise of the art world. Her goal is to facilitate interaction between contemporary art and the public and to teach the next generation a broader approach to art history. Diversity, inclusion, and creativity are essential aspects of her practice. We are so grateful to have her back at Nevada. Today, Vivian will be taking us through the Lilies permanent collection to have and to hold. This collection acknowledges that art does not fit into convenient categories, periods, styles, or worldviews. We all have the capacity to encounter art on multiple terms and in various contexts. Perhaps no other learning environment is better suited to these encounters than a research university campus. The Lilly is committed to growing our connections across and beyond campus as we strengthen and build upon our commitment to our collection. The Lilly and the Department of Art are proud to be stewards of this incredible global collection. Hey everyone, the Lilly Museum of Art is fairly new. We opened our doors in February 2019. This is our permanent collection display, which shows just a fraction of our collection of more than 5,000 objects. The concept of this exhibition takes into consideration the origins of our collection. Most of our objects came to us from private local collectors. The title, To Heaven to Hold, refers to these domestic histories of these objects while also alluding to our commitment to care and share this collection with the university and our community at large. If you look around the gallery, you notice that these objects were not organized chronologically, stylistically, or by culture. By not abiding to conventional museum practices, we wanted to challenge Western notions of time, taste, and style. We organize this exhibition thematically. These themes, time, courtship and family, community politics, ritual and the ever after, resonate with all humans, regardless of their cultural background. The juxtaposition of these artworks create unique dialogues that go beyond geographical, media, and time boundaries. This approach also creates a dynamic environment in which, depending on the visitor background, objects could fit into different themes within the exhibition. All right, so we're here at the gallery. If you look around, what is missing from the walls? There's no labels. Yeah. Um, how's, how does that make you feel? It makes me want to know more. It, it makes you wonder. You may, do you think we forgot to put the labels of up? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a lot of people ask us why our labels are not there. I spent a lot of time in, in museums just kind of observing people and how they interact with art. And a lot of museum goers, they will go to a piece and look at the label and look at the label and look at the label and then they'll be like, ah, oh, Picasso. All right, now I'm gonna uh -huh. interact with this piece. So they only look at a piece if they recognize the name. <laughs> so by taking the labels out of the equation, we give people the opportunity to find new artists that they don't know about, to really enjoy art without any distractions around it. And then what I tell people normally is, go around the gallery, look at everything, and when you find a piece that you like, then go to the catalog to, Makes sense. to get more information. As Amy mentioned, I am a museologist. I've spent a lot of time in museums just observing the way visitors interact with art, and most people will first look at the label before looking at the artwork itself. Another peculiar thing a lot of museum goers do is to only stop and to appreciate a particular piece when they recognize the name of the artist. By taking the label out of the equation, we give our audience the opportunity to interact with these artworks without any distractions. We also give people the opportunity to find new artists to fall in love with. I always tell visitors to go around, experience the show, and then look at the catalog for more information. One misconception about this setup is that people feel alienated. However, our intention is to remediate that 
to show that everyone will have the cap capability of appreciating art. It is in our nature as humans. We don't need to be an academic or an art historian. We can look at a painting and feel something without knowing anything about it. Let's move over to family and courtship. This is one of my favorite parts in this exhibition. All right, so let's check out this piece. What do you see when you look at it? Someone with a hood and a puffy coat. Okay. Do you know what they're up to? No. Uh-uh. No. Can you tell me their gender? No. Their age? No. The color of their skin? No. I know. So what the artist is doing here is really inviting you to contemplate your own bias. You know, what, what this brings to you? Does it make you feel uncomfortable that you don't know anything about this piece? So it really um, kind of touches with the unknown, mm -hmm. which goes back to the labels. <laughs> sure. Does it make you feel uncomfortable being around and having no information about a piece? So these kinds of uh, interactions with, with art too are very meaningful because mm -hmm. you don't need to be an, a specialist in order to come up to this photograph and be like, oh, I can describe what is going on here. I can uh, come up with my own ideas and my own, um, you know, use my own knowledge in order to appreciate this piece. Yeah, it makes you come up kind of with your own story in your head about what's going on. What's going on, yeah, it is. This is the perfect example of a piece that could be located under another theme under this gallery, maybe politics. When you're looking at Edmund's piece, you might ask yourself why the curator chose to place it by a cradle board. Cradle boards are used by indigenous populations as baby carriers to swaddle babies as well. Mothers use these to transport, protect their babies from the environment, and also to make their babies feel protected. You might think of a hoodie in a similar way. People use them for protection from the cold and weather in general. However, let's now think about hoodies in the context of racial profiling. Trayvon Martin, a teenager, was killed by his neighbor because he was wearing a hooded sweatshirt. His neighbor profiled Martin as a criminal because of his attire and color of his skin. Imagine being Martin's mother, knowing how little you can do to protect your own child. These are the kinds of dialogues we're trying to forge when juxtaposing these pieces. Many of these dialogues may be created by the viewer's own personal experiences. We're not trying to offer a fix or authoritative narrative. Rather, we give the public the opportunity to create their own stories with these objects. All right, so um, could you pick two pieces in this gallery that you would be able to create some sort of dialogue? These two. These two. Because I've been at the university a long time. Yeah. And I know this is Catherine Mackey, and this one reminds me of other buildings on campus. Cool. So this is the kinds of, of dialogues that we want people to create, to use their own experience and their own background in order to come up with these kinds of uh, interactions between the two pieces. I like that you chose this one. Um, there is a very interesting story behind this particular painting. It's haunted because mm -hmm. every time they try to move it around, it would fall on somebody. Oh, geez. And so when we brought her here after uh, restored to its glory, so this, this was actually in very bad shape, and uh, we got restored the frame and the painting uh, itself, um, we had a colleague coming here and saying, hey, she's not happy in here. Oh, wow. And we're like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> what should we do? So we brought two pieces from uh, the Tiffany Silver mm -hmm. from the, the CAC Museum that they loaned to us um, to make her happy. So here oh, are... Oh, wow. And has two. it helped? Yes, I think we solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> She's happier. <laughs> How much does this weigh? It's... Uh, very, very heavy, and actually this um, frame was uh, designed by the same architect that 
um, designed the Mackey School of Mines. Oh, Delta. wow. And don't tell Catherine, but the frame <laughs> is more valuable than the portrait itself. <laughs> no, we have several uh, portraits of university presidents in Morrill Hall, and yeah. same thing, the frames are extremely valuable, which mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know. Yeah, yeah. As you can see, you can use your own imagination to navigate this space. We want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable within our walls and can appreciate art in any fashion they choose to do so. A lot of exhibitions will provide you with a narrative that dictates how you interpret these objects and how you go around the exhibition. In contrast, with this methodology, we ask members of our local communities to write text about an object of their choosing. These individuals range from students, scholars, children, artists, and many others. One of my favorite texts is by Emil, a second grader, and here's what he has to say about these Chinese porcelain vases. I think these vases are cool because they have a lot of imagination. The two specific birds look like peacocks. It reminds me of this dragon that has a lot of feathers. There's a story of this one boy. He had a dream that he was on a ship and the ship wrecked. The dragon came and saved his life, and he didn't even realize he didn't even realize it as these dragons are so quick. I really like that story. I also think that there's a lot of life in these pieces. I really like nature, my friends do too. Sometimes we play nature games and they have taught me so much about it. There's so much detail on these vases, but when you first look at it, you just see a couple birds, leaves, branches, and flowers. When you look close at it, you can see the strokes of the artist's paintbrush and the sculpting they did. There's also Chinese writing on them. I don't know what it means, but I have a Chinese friend and she might be able to tell me what it's saying. I think it might be a story about birds flying through the sky, then landing on a branch. The two colorful birds were magical, and I am not sure what else it would say, but I think they are telling a pretty good story, and it would be cool to read that. These texts provide the visitors with another way of seeing these objects, another perspective. They also add a chorus of diverse voices to accompany the regular curatorial perspective that can both unify and constrain an exhibition.